tapes. Okay, well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Lisette Coley, and I'm Executive Director of Parapsychology Foundation. And on behalf of our Board of Trustees and our President, Mrs. Eileen Coley, I welcome you here this evening. Uh, Sydney Kirkpatrick, our speaker this evening, is the best-selling author of Edgar Casey and American Prophet, a biography of the famed psychic and father of the holistic health movement. He was given full access, apparently, to Casey's papers and the recollections of his family and friends and associates, allowing him to write what has been described as the most informative and enlightening book ever written about Casey. Mr. Kirkpatrick is the author also of A Cast of Killers, a New York Times bestseller, and Lords of Saipan, and he is the writer and director of My Father the President, an acclaimed documentary of Theodore Roosevelt, correct? And we are very pleased to have him here with us this evening, uh, participating in our perspective lecture series. So ladies and gentlemen, Sidney Kirkpatrick. Um, <coughs> Well, I actually, I, I just, uh, before I begin, I, I really want to say uh, what a cool place this is. I, I, I really love it. And, and about uh, probably seven, eight years ago, I wandered in here and was made to feel very much at home. Thank you so much. And, uh, you know, uh, I, I, you know, there were no, um, you know, no one was asking for my credentials. No one asked exactly what I was looking for. I had credentials, but... You know, it, it was, and I was made to feel very much at home, and I thank you for that. And and I mean, it shows what kind of organization this is. Um, I don't know. Many of you have seen this. I'm surprised uh, Lisette didn't say that this was going to be reprinted, because I think it's a, uh, it's a great book, and I, and this ought to be too. You know, I don't know. I don't know if you've seen this, and uh, you know, we have good news about this and we have bad news. And of course good news is that, you know, with the reprinting many thousands of people will be able to be reintroduced to Eileen Garrett. Um, the bad news, however, is that the Surgeon General has also read this book now and he's asking the Parapsychology Foundation to put a warning label, Surgeon General's warning. Uh, use of this product may alter your conscience. Well, that's my uh, attempt at stand-up humor. Um, uh, actually, I've got more than that, because, uh, you know, I, I was just thinking, um, just in, in the last few days, uh, what a weird guy I've become, really, since moving into this... Um, into this field and uh, talking about psychics and researching psychics and it really came home to me the other day uh, when I was going to the airport and my bag just set off just was you know when I was coming to LaGuardia the other day my my bag just set off all kinds of alarms when I was going through the security checkpoint and they made me empty it out and this is actually what set it off it's called crudolium and this is actually uh, very aptly named. This is an Edgar Casey product. You know, uh, Casey gave a lot of bizarre medical treatments, uh, recommended many different kinds of products. And, and when I started uh, my own research about Edgar Casey, I, I, I chose five different Casey treatments, remedies to try. And, and, and uh, the one that most interested me was on hair loss. And uh, this is what Edgar Casey recommended for hair loss, crude oleum. And it's actually made of uh, Pennsylvania crude oil. And, uh, you know, in, in trance, Casey actually said, you'll, you'll never find uh, somebody who works on oil rigs, you know, who's bald. And, uh, and actually, you can even trace it back, because uh, in Spain, this is sort of like a homespun remedy, the Spanish women uh, massage creosote 
and other things into their hair. Sounds bizarre, but you know, they, they, we, we, like a lot of KC products, though, um, there's sort of more than meets the eye, and there's a reason this comes in a can and not a bottle. And uh, it, it's you know, K, we know KC was. Uh, uh, talking about astrology and numerology, but this is sort of like they don't tell you about Casey is that he was also into aromatherapy this stuff um, I tried this on the um, in the uh, men's changing room at the South Pasadena YMCA and, and literally you can open this thing and within Oh, I'd say probably less than three minutes. I had the whole men's changing room to myself. <laughs> I mean, it, it, it just, you know, uh, uh, you, you could even argue that you grow hair because you can't find a hairdresser to stand close enough to you. <laughs> it, it's really, and, and, and it, it stays with you. Um, and not, not to beat this into the ground, but um, uh, I went to a Casey convention, uh, which they call the Congress, sort of Congress is where all the Caseyites come together in Virginia Beach and I formed this little men's group trading crude oleum stories <laughs> um, and the best one and I won't go on too much about this but um, best one was this fellow in Lynchburg Virginia and you know you're supposed to put this on your hair you sort of massage it in and it, you're gonna leave it sit for 45 minutes and so he apparently was in in his bathroom uh, reading the newspaper as he was massaging and gonna let it sit and uh, he heard sirens outside and, and he came running out in his bathrobe and uh, the Lynchburg Fire Department was coming up the driveway because his roommate thought there was an oil leak in the house. <laughs> um, anyway, it, it's a shame, uh, you know, Eileen Garrett didn't come up with the cream rinse to this and, and it, it might have made a uh, uh, a nice combination because you know it, it's so interesting you, you put Eileen Garrett with, with Edgar Casey, and they really do make a, a, a great combination because they are sort of like two facets you know uh, of the same thing um, and it really was only natural that, that they should meet and, and that's really the subject of, of, of this talk tonight because uh, they met right here in New York uh, 1934 and they gave, each gave a reading on the other, which is where the title of this talk comes, Dueling Psychics. Um, but before I get to that, I just want to talk a little bit about uh, how I came into this, because it really speaks to uh, this crude oleum product, speaks to Eileen Garrett, speaks to a lot of things. Um, as Lauren here, will surely attest, this is uh, a friend from Pasadena, California, who's known me for quite some time. Uh, you know, as little as seven, eight years ago, I was quite a skeptic. I was a serious skeptic. Um, certainly, I would have said that anyone who put their faith in a trans medium ought to see a psychiatrist. Uh, I sort of turned from that now, and I, I'm sort of convinced that every psychiatrist ought to consult a trans medium before they ever treat a single patient. Uh, it was a sort of not an easy transition for me. Um, and, and it actually began uh, in the parking lot at my children's school. Um, I send my kids to a Ru Rudolf Steiner school. I don't know if, if you know Rudolf Steiner, German mystic. Um, Actually, Rudolf Steiner, Casey, and Garrett each share a wonderful thing because they, they all saw little people when they were children. They, saw, they, had, they all had imaginary playmates. But um, I was accosted in the school parking lot by the administrator at my children's school. And she slapped a copy of There is a River in my hand. There is a River was the first you know, biography written of Edgar Casey some you know, uh, 50 years ago. And uh, I was a bit trying to be very polite, but very, very much the last thing I wanted to read, the last subject I would have ever considered was Edgar Cayce, uh, or, or any kind of psychic phenomena, because I just didn't believe it. And, and I come from a, a family of staunch, skeptical New York writers. Uh, my older sister is the editor of National Geographic. Uh, my younger sister is a fiction writer. 
Uh, my father uh, was a writer. My mother was writing thinly veiled books about my dad while I was in diapers. Um, you know, and, and we're very, very skeptical. Uh, I, I haven't gotten my mother yet to read this Casey book. I keep working on it, but uh, so far she hasn't. Um, but I, I was very polite with, with the school administrator, Nancy, and uh, um, she kept at it. She kept dogging me. She kept saying, well, this is going to be the subject for your next book. And she was very, uh, sort of almost like a frontal assault on me. Uh, and of course, the more I protested, the, uh, uh, oh, the mailbox at my school, you know, started filling up with Edgar Cayce remedies, Edgar Cayce testimonials, uh, the book, The Sleeping Prophet. It, you know, it, it just really, it became a tug of war, uh, almost to the point where I was thinking maybe my kids weren't, maybe this wasn't the right school or, uh, or maybe, maybe, maybe my kids even wouldn't be invited back. Um, it's interesting. One, one of the things you'll find about the Casey work, and uh, like many, uh, like so much of the truth, so many materials that come through uh, psychics, that the more you push something away, uh, the sooner it comes up and, and smacks you in the face. Um, synchronicity was not in my vocabulary. Um, and yet, you know, I look back and there's so many, so many interesting things that uh, uh, synchronicity certainly plays into. Um, while I was in the midst of this tug of war with Nancy, we found ourselves on the same plane flight same American Airlines flight to Washington, D.C. And um, she had a captive audience this time. Casey, Casey, Casey. And, and you know, I, I, it's not that I, I thought uh, she was stupid or anything. I just thought, you know, she was misled. And um, the Casey papers are in Virginia Beach, you know, a few hours outside of uh, Washington, D.C. And it was really only natural that we should, you know, take this debate to the uh, to Virginia Beach to the to the Casey files. Um, the Casey vault in Virginia Beach is probably about the size of this room. I mean, it's you know rows of file cabinets. Um, and I went in uh, to find the reading that would uh, show Nancy the error of her ways. Um, uh, I think, you know, I was erroneously believing that uh, a lot of these readings, just like um, one 900 psychic, these things are vague, ambiguous ramblings, open for interpretation. The facts had been embroidered. Um, well, I, I went looking for that reading that afternoon, and, and by that evening I hadn't found it, and certainly the next day I hadn't found it, and by the third day, an interesting thing starts happening. Um, two things. Certainly with the Casey material, and, and I think this certainly is similar to, to Eileen Garrett's reading, it's the specificity of the readings that, that certainly capture you with, the, with Casey. You know, names, dates, locations, uh, nothing vague or ambiguous. Um, Certainly there's elements of that, but, but by and large, it's the specifics. And in terms of the medical readings, of course, which Casey is best known for, you know, red blood count, white blood count, body temperature, um, it makes a very powerful case uh, for the truth of psychic phenomena. Um, but not only the specificity, specificity blah, the volume. Uh, you know, he, had, he gave probably in his lifetime some 28,000 readings, uh, of which 14,000 uh, had been documented, you know, transcribed, in which there are files for. Um, I was talking about that actually a couple weeks ago with Natalie Cole, you know, the, the singer. And it's... Um, you know, Natalie's very interested in spirituality, perhaps not the psychic side of uh, spirituality so much, but um, the volume certainly impressed her as it impressed me. And, you know, it, it, it was as if uh, she had to do, uh, put on a different uh, nightclub routine, Las Vegas show, twice a day, every day, 
for 45 years. It just doesn't happen. And, um, you know, that really confronts you when you get into Casey. And I think were you to troop out any psychic uh, for a skeptic, Casey is the ideal one. And, and it's certainly one of the reasons why I latched onto that, um, you know, to do a book. Um, you make an interesting transition, and, and I think many of you probably have already made that transition uh, and made it long before I did. You stop asking yourself, in, in, in the situation with Edgar Casey, you stop asking yourself, well, did he do what he is said to have done? Because the evidence is truly overwhelming. I mean, it's just, it's there. Uh, you know, Harvard, Dean of Harvard has studied that work. Dean of Columbia has studied the work. You, you can't argue he did what he did. The question starts becoming, well, how? And, uh, and certainly that's kindergarten, uh, you know, 101 psychic phenomena. Uh, but of course that's where I was. Um, with Casey, you start making other jumps, of course. You, you, know, you, you start asking, well, how did he do it? And that leads to other questions. Why did he do it? Uh, what's the message behind it? Um, you know, it's sort of like a, a Pandora's box in, in, in many respects, because once you open it, your perspective changes, and, and it's very difficult uh, to see things uh, in the way you did before. I think a lot of researchers truly discover that it's like a, it's it's not like a revolving door where you can step in and sort of take a visual perusal of it, and if you don't like it, come around, step out the other way. It, it truly changes your perspective, and and certainly that was the genesis, you know, of the Casey book, uh, and it was really the, the the start of many things in my life and, and the start of many changes. Uh, certainly I lost an agent over it and um, had to make certain career shifts because my background has been as a, as a true crime investigator, uh, nonfiction writer. Um, you know, this was not an area I felt especially uh, comfortable at and you could even argue that I was the worst person of all to, to tackle a Casey book. As I was saying earlier, earlier tonight, one of the great assets uh, about Edgar Casey, and certainly now, um, there have clearly been, you know, a lot of books about Casey. Some 200 books have been written. You know, why another book? Um, well, enough time has elapsed that it's a really, it's a great time actually to dust, you know, to dust the Casey material off and take a, a second long hard look at it, because so many things that Casey was saying that were completely dismissed in the 20s and 30s as ludicrous are now virtually state-of-the-art, uh, certainly in terms of the m medical readings for, for which, you know, Casey's best known. Psoriasis. I, I don't know how familiar you are uh, with the Casey treatments, but um, something like psoriasis, Edgar Casey was saying in the 1920s that psoriasis was a result of the thinning of the walls of the colon that toxins were leaching out into the system and had to come out, so they were coming out through the skin. Um, dismissed as ludicrous. Uh, what Casey was saying about breast cancer, diabetes, uh, prostate cancer. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of the, the, you know, a lot of physicians are, are now sort of returning, you know, to look at those remedies uh, that Casey was using. Um, we also had an, an interesting asset in Casey's lifetime. Uh, names were not put to the readings. Um, you know, very much like a patient-physician relationship. Uh, you know, if you knew that Irving Berlin was worried about hemorrhoids, um, Irving Berlin wouldn't come to Casey. Um, and Casey himself, you know, didn't beat his own drum. Uh, as, as many of you know, he, he earned a living as a photographer for much of his life. Um, he wasn't out selling himself. And it really wasn't un until just a few years ago uh, when they let me into the vault, you know, and I was able to put names to some of these readings that um, you got a sense of how many important people, how many interesting people were consulting Casey on, on a regular basis, IBM engineers. 
uh, the president of Goodyear Tire and Rubber Company. It's a shame Firestone, you know, didn't have a reading. Um, but when you start actually, you know, actually the, the, the big names are really unimportant to the Casey story because, um, you know, Casey w w was much more homespun than Eileen Garrett. Um, it was sort of the rank and file people that Casey did readings for um, that really breathed life into the Casey story. You know, once you realize that, um, you know, an example I like to use, uh, a man's come to Casey asking for an inscription. Um, seems like a very typical reading until you realize that number 891 is a guy named Lamar Jones, who's a tombstone cutter. And, uh, and that the inscription he is looking for uh, is for his wife's tombstone. And that she's the godmother to the Casey children. It takes on a different meaning. And, and you, you get a sense when you start putting names to these readings that there are these groups literally all across the United States who are requesting readings. And you get a sense of almost trees growing up around the country because people are recommending, you know, that their uncles, their cousins get readings. And, and you really get a sense of what, um, Tom, why, you know, why Tom Chagru named his biography, There is a River, because you really get a sense of, of, of a real river and a passage. Um, I won't talk about Casey too much, uh, but I do want to talk, uh, I want to mention two readings, I think, specifically, that, that, that I found really convincing. Um, uh, one of which, actually, uh, I just researched the other day, because I, I, I went on NPR, and uh, I have a friend uh, who works at the same radio station where the NPR was, was coming through, and he called me in a panic, saying that uh, the man who was going to interview me is not the one I thought it was, and that the president of the Skeptic Society uh, had been brought in specifically and that this was, you know, a hatchet job on its way. Um, turned out great. Um, I found a reading that was done uh, a block away from the address where the president of the Skeptic Society lives. Uh, family they would know. Long time family. And it, it was a, a very classic reading. It was for a man named Richmond C. on Lake Avenue in Altadena, California. And uh, uh, Richmond's uh, fiance, Beatrice, had read about Edgar Cayce, uh, a magazine article called Miracle Man of Virginia Beach. Um, determined to get a reading, physicians dead set against it. This stuff's hocus pocus. We don't need it. We can treat Richmond. Beatrice was determined. Absolutely, we're getting a reading. If you want to remain our physicians, you know, you'll write Casey. So, letter was written Casey from Altadena, California. Mail, you know, back in the, in the 1930s was delivered uh, considerably faster than it is today. Um, we know because we have the, uh, you know, postmarked envelopes. And, uh, you know, request went from, you know, Altadena to Virginia Beach, arrived day and a half later. Um, Casey at that point was getting uh, requests for a lot of readings, but um, peculiar thing had sort of started happening with the Casey readings where he, he was uh, literally picking, pointing, you know, to the requests, uh, sort of almost being psychic, psychically led, you might argue. But uh, did the reading, it was transcribed, sent back off the very same day that it was received. And um, there was no indication in the letter, you know, what Richmond's problem was. Uh, he'd been blind since he was 11 years old. He was a composer. He was a violinist. Um, the Casey reading, perfect, just point blank. This man's blind. He's suffering from cataracts. Uh, this is what you've got to do about it. Um, osteopathy, uh, certain solutions to be swabbed over his eyes. It went on like that. Uh, two weeks later, uh, the applicant, you know, the treatments are being done. 
um, and actually, it's more rare than, than, you, would, than you would suspect that uh, the treatments are being done. So often, Casey would recommend these bizarre treatments and couldn't find a physician to do them. But in this case, Beatrice was all on top of her physicians. It was done. Uh, six months later, uh, Richmond is seeing, you know, light and dark for the first time in a few years. Um, and uh, a year later, he's, he's conducting for the first time uh, and seeing the musicians he's conducting. Um, great argument. Two and a half years later, Richmond's driving from Altadena, California to Virginia Beach to thank Edgar Cayce in person. Classic example of a reading. However, um, you know, there, there's a great deal more to it and, and, and a lot more to it that I couldn't talk about on NPR. Because uh, as, as I think you'll find with a lot of the Casey readings, the deeper you go, the more you realize how, uh, uh, how much deeper you can go. Um, as the story goes, uh, Beatrice and Richmond, who arrive, you know, in Virginia Beach to thank Edgar Casey, Beatrice gets out of the car, and she's, and then Edgar Casey uh, is is standing at the front of the house, and tears start coming, you know, down his face. Um, he's seeing something in Beatrice, um, you know, that'll later be revealed in a life reading, and. Uh, I don't know, are you familiar with life readings as opposed to medical readings? You know, um, life readings, you, you know, would go back, start certainly with reincarnation. Um, but a, a wonderful, richer story starts unfolding. Uh, a story of how, uh, you know, in previous lifetimes, uh, Richmond and Beatrice uh, had been father-daughter in Beverly, Kentucky, where Edgar Casey had grown up. Um, you, you get a sense of, um, in these readings, not only a, of a river, but almost as a, a genealogical river. I'll explain that. Uh, but let me give one, one other example of a reading, uh, a reading that, that I had a lot of wrestling match over, and I've been very uncomfortable about, and certainly was very uncomfortable when I first came across it. It's so a reading done for a five-year-old child in uh, 1940, April of 1940. Five-year-old child from Trucksville, Pennsylvania, who had come to the attention of uh, some ARE members here in New York who'd written Edgar Casey and said, this is a very unusual child, do a reading for her. Um, you know, with, with Eileen Garrett's readings, uh, and with, with her work, you, you often get a lot of fireworks. I mean, there was some, you know, interesting phenomena. Uh, she was sent out to investigate interesting phenomena. Interesting phenomena, phenomena almost surrounded her. You know, very dramatic kind of things. It, it really wasn't like that with Edgar Cayce. Uh, when Edgar Cayce did a reading, um, a routine had been set for years that he followed. And uh, by 1940, you know, he'd done some 23,000 readings, and uh, a reading for, for this five-year-old child, um, no one expected anything out of the unusual, uh, which is really what made what happened so interesting. Um, reading was done in Virginia Beach at, at Edgar Casey's house. Um, as usual, you know, Edgar Casey had to remove his tie. For some reason, his uh, throat always swelled when he went into a reading. He went back down on, on the sofa. Um, there were three people, you know, who were in the room, a stenographer who always took down what was said, Edgar Casey's wife, who would guide him into trance. And um, for almost inexplicable reasons, everyone in the room suddenly started crying. Uh, there was nothing said, nothing to trigger it. It was just tears. And we know there were tears uh, beyond what people have said because you can go into the vault and you can read the transcript, uh, you know, that Gladys Davis, his secretary, is taking down and there's teardrops on it. Um, Gladys Davis's cousin, Mildred, is working, you know, at the beach 
uh, her job, her task during these readings was to write down um, any unusual phenomena. There's teardrops on, on her uh, pad also, but a lot of other things. Windows started rattling, it felt like, a, it's described like a breeze blew through the room. Um, you know, that's the kind of stuff skeptics have, have a lot of difficulty with. It's sort of like table levitating or something, you know, when there are uh, such a presence of something, you know, where everyone is crying. It, it turned out to be a really unusual reading. Edgar Casey very rarely, maybe ten times out of so many, you know, 23,000 readings, so rarely did anything ever come through and actually stop and introduce themselves. You know, in, in the Casey organization, who or what comes through Casey is always referred to as the source. You know, the source said this, the source said that. You don't get more than that, except on very rare occasions. And, and, and you know, the reading for five-year-old Faith Harding was one of those occasions. And um, uh, Archangel Michael, comes through, stops and introduces himself. The, this is the archangel. I've come, you know, these are my words, I'm sort of paraphrasing, but, you know, I've come uh, with wonderful, glad news uh, the, of the child you have before you. Um, this is God's gift to the 21st century. This is a child with very special gifts, far beyond those of Edgar Cayce's. Um, sort of went on in that vein. And uh, it was so very unusual um, in the larger scheme of things, because not only uh, did a presence, you know, Archangel actually stop and make an appearance, but, you know, here was a child, you know, supposedly with, with gifts even greater th than those of Edgar Cayce's. Um, of course, afterwards, Edgar Casey, Gladys, Gertrude Casey, everyone wanted to know who's the girl. What's what's you know what's this is very special, and um, you know requests m went went back to New York, went up to Connecticut, went to Pennsylvania, and and interesting stories started filtering back. Uh, Five-year-old Faith Harding, you know, uh, started speaking in complete sentences at age two. At age three, she was, you know, uh, reportedly on the sofa prophesying like you would out of the Bible. Um, of course, in a thing like this, you don't know what's, you know, what's hyperbole and what's not. However, um, whatever happened in Trucksville, Pennsylvania with five-year-old Faith Harding, um, was enough that a, a local reporter quit his job and was pitched a tent in the Harding's backyard uh, and was, you know, busily taking and making a transcript of, uh, you know, everything coming out of Little Faith's mouth. Um, anyway, there were two stories that came back, two, two stories which, which are sort of most told about Faith Harding, and, and the first is um, Faith Harding on a bus going through Pennsylvania, uh, four and a half years old, throws an absolute fit with her mother, just to, to the point where the driver actually stops and asks Faith and her mother to get off this bus because she's just throwing too much of a fit. And, and according to popular legend, the bus continued down the road and burst into flames. Um, and even, you know, an even bigger story that was circulating uh, concerned a gardener from next door. Gardener had a son with polio and would you know, in the afternoons, pick up his son and carry him to work every day and sit him in, a, in, in the shade under a tree. And, uh, you know, Gardner would go off and do his work, and at the end of the day, he'd pick him up and take him home. Um, Faith Harding apparently wandered out of the house, um, and whatever went on between Faith and, and this kid with polio uh, was such that the kid got up and walked home. 
Uh, Edgar Casey, of course, Gladys, everyone was very eager, got to meet this woman, got to meet this child. Um, and, and, and of course, uh, word went out and an uh, arrangement was made uh, in Westchester County. And they, they sort of met. Uh, Faith Harding was, was brought to an ARE member's house uh, for Edgar Casey to give a reading. Uh, as it's, you know, as the story goes, a, a station wagon pulled up in front of this house in Westchester and written on the side of the car was the little prophetess. And they had this five-year-old, well, she was six at this point, child dressed up in a sort of white, uh, you know, Roman toga type outfit. And uh, clearly, you know, a child put on display. Um, Edgar Casey was suspicious right at the start. Uh, Virginia Harding, the child's mother, you know, acting very much like a stage mother manager, had had a uh, had a book, had had a uh, you know photo album of pictures with her daughter. Um, you know, her daughter's picture superimposed with those of the Buddha and the Virgin Mary, and. Um, uh, all very suspicious, you know, typical, seeming to be a typical stage mother manager. Um, Casey did a, did a reading. Um, and again, you know, Archangel came out, and this time, uh, you know, you not only got windows rattling and you got a, a wind blowing through the room, but the Archangel came out and in a voice which was truly unlike Casey's voice. I mean, usually when Casey would go into a trance, or invariably, you know, he just spoke with a southern accent, but it, it was his own voice. There, there was no, you know, big, great change. But in this case, it was a change, and the archangel was angry. How dare you treat my gift in such a, you know, these are my words, in such a cavalier manner? You know, w w what's gotten into you people? Um, this, don't you realize the special gift that's been given you? And uh, this child will, you know, will never have a normal childhood, but must be raised uh, with love and, and nurturing, and she must be cared for. Uh, she'll never have a normal childhood, but she'll have a childhood. And um, it went on. It said, you know, in previous incarnations, this child, Faith Harding, was uh, Elizabeth, mother of John the Baptist. Um, it was quite, it's quite powerful. And, you know, to a skeptic, to Sidney Kirkpatrick, uh, you know, it smacked of, of just almost bad drama. Uh, but it wasn't considered bad drama with the Casey people. And uh, they were quite frightened. Uh, wanted to know what this was about, kept sending emissaries out, couldn't find out anything. And, you know, th th this occurred in 1940. Um, four years later, you know, Edgar Casey would be dead. Um, both his children, you know, were uh, taken off to war, you know, enlisted. This was a time after There Is a River was published, and there were just requests just coming in by the bushel full, and they couldn't track what happened to Faith Harding. Um, it wasn't until the 1950s, long after Edgar Casey died, that anyone started digging through the files and recognized these two very unusual readings for, you know, for Faith Harding. And um, the man, you know, a man was assigned to go find Faith Harding. Uh, he was sent up to, you know, Trucksville, Pennsylvania, and he did his research and came back with a, just a gruesome story, a story of a, a custody battle between Harry Harding, foam typewriter pad manufacturer, and his wife Virginia Harding, who was a nurse, over faith. And the father was accusing the mother of brainwashing this child, uh, of putting words into her mouth, of uh, treating her like the little prophetess. And the mother was accusing the father of uh, stepping on this child, of trying to uh, pull her away from her spiritual roots, her spiritual origins. And 
at that time, you know, in the 1950s, early 60s, um, these things could still get ugly. I mean, they can still, they certainly get ugly now, but in, in the case of Harry and Virginia Harding, that custody battle began escalating to the point where dad got a uh, physician to sign off on a lobotomy for the mother. I uh, got a physician to declare the mother insane, and um, rather than undergo surgery, she gave up custody of Faith Harding. Dad got Faith, pulled her from home, names changed, she was gone. Uh, Albert Turner, who was sent to Pennsylvania to find her, you know, came back with this truly a tragic story. Wh whether the girl had gifts or not, you know, it, it was one of these ugly, you know, ugly things, very ugly things. I was particularly interested in Faith Harding, not only because she had two very unusual readings, but because she was one of those Casey babies. You know, Edgar Casey died in 1945. Uh, in the last five years of his life or so, he probably gave upwards to 200 readings on children. And, of course, it was children I was looking for. Uh, this wasn't just going to be a paper hunt as far as Sidney Kirkpatrick was concerned. I was determined to find, you know, as many people as I possibly could who'd had readings. I really wanted to, I wanted to see uh, I wanted to test the truth of it, you know, the good investigative reporter that I believed myself to be. Um, we took off in an RV. We, we bought this uh, rackety old RV and we stripped it out and put in some file cabinets and a computer. And we spent the summer with uh, Edgar Casey readings on a CD-ROM and the log book of everyone who'd had these readings and we took off uh, across the country, and uh, Faith Harding was, you know, pretty much top on our list. And um, couldn't find anything in, in Trucksville, Pennsylvania, but did track what happened to Virginia Harding. And she'd become a nurse in a retirement home uh, outside of Hartford, Connecticut. What was interesting about this was that there was a statue of Virginia Harding in this retirement home, in the courtyard. You know, life-size statue. No one in the retirement home had any idea what the statue was doing in the courtyard, uh, you know, and it, but clearly somebody, you know, Virginia Harding had touched the life of somebody or had been important enough that you know, that, that a statue uh, was made. Eventually we dug out Virginia Harding's funeral papers. I uh, found out who paid for the funeral. Found a sister in, in, in a, a retirement home down in Florida. And the sister was, a, was able to tell us, you know, what Faith's new name was. So, you know, with our short list, when, when, once we had the name, it was just a question of, of going through, uh, you know, all the people with that name. And eventually, you know, someone answered and, and, and you know, we were saying, um, looking for Faith Harding, whose mother is Virginia Harding. And somebody said, Virgin Virginia Harding? That was my mother. Um... It was great. It was really good. And I, I knew it the moment there was that pause, because she didn't know who her mother was. She knew her mother's name, but she didn't remember her mother. She also didn't know who Edgar Casey was. Now that was really good, and I'll tell you why. Because so many of those trance readings that Casey gave, you didn't know for sure for those Casey babies if they grew up to live into their readings, you know, like, son, wouldn't you rather be reading his medical textbook, you know, if Casey says that they're going to be a physician? You just don't know. And, you know, the, the Casey organizations, they're, they're a real tight group, group of people, and the mothers, the fathers have readings, the uncles have readings, and when the babies come along, you know, uh, one of the people we interviewed, actually, um, 
one of the Casey babies, you know, said, well, yes, I did become an attorney like Edgar said I would, uh, but he actually hated the Casey readings because his mom used to make him get a colonic <laughs> once a month, and, and it was like, ring the dinner bell, it's time for your colonic. And it was just like, you know, he just went kicking and screaming from the racing. But this was wonderful. This was, uh, uh, this was great because she, you know, Faith Harding didn't even know who Edgar Casey was. She didn't even know what a reading was, let alone, you know, so, so this was really, this was good. And, uh, and we said, well, you know, um, we're going to be driving through your part of the country um, next Monday. Uh, you know, can we stop and, and meet you? Stop and see you. And, uh, uh, you know, she said, oh, yeah, yeah, we'd, yeah, good. I, I would like to know, I'd like to, you know, uh, know more about my mom. And, you know, of course, we immediately turned around from where we were and, uh, you know, hightailed it, you know, uh, 650 miles <laughs> across the country. And, um, you know, I, I got to admit, um, my own limitations, because we, you know, we're, we pulled up in front of this uh, trailer park. I mean, it's not even a fancy trailer park. It's a trailer park, you know, and I'm thinking, God's gift to the 21st century, trailer park. You know, I mean, it really, it really reveals my own limitations, because, you know, when, when you get caught up in, in, a lot of the, in a lot of these readings and a lot of the trance material, you start thinking... God's gift, princes die, or somebody like that, you know, you, you're not looking um, in the right places. Very suspicious husband, at least we, th we, we weren't sure who the guy was at first, just Frank, you know, he was standing right beside Faith, who's, you know, wonderful grandmother, rather portly, but, you know, nice 65-year-old grandmother, and Frank, and Frank was suspicious. Seriously suspicious. Like, Faith doesn't remember anything about her mother, and she doesn't know anything about this Edgar Casey. Now, what do you really want here? What do you want? She doesn't know anything about Casey. She can't help you at all. And we, you know, said, well, you know, uh, Edgar Casey met your mom, and she, he actually met you too, and we have this file of uh, photographs. Actually, I have them. Some of them. We have a picture of, um, you know, a statue in a nursing home, and you can just see, you know, face like, let me see that. I mean, her hands are really just coming right out, and, and you know, she wants these, and uh, you know, it's 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 is nice, and she bring, brings us inside, and you know, despite despite Frank, uh, you know, we start to tell you, well, you know, your your mother, she was must have been very important. I mean, we sort of have to extrapolate here. Um, and it was a nice meeting and everything, but I certainly didn't get a sense of, you know, God's gift to the 21st century, and, um, you know, maybe I shouldn't have been looking for that. Uh, uh, so, you know, we, we, we go outside, and uh, Frank stays up at the door, and I don't know if you've ever driven one of these monsters on the road, but you, you got to go in, you got to pump the gas pedal like nine, ten times, and then you got to charge it up, you got to let the engine run it, it, as soon as the thing gets cold. And so that's what we were doing, and, and Nancy, you know, the school administrator who got me into this, is sitting in the passenger sheet, and she's rolled down her window, and Faith is leaning forward, thanking her for the pictures and stuff, and says, you know, it's such a shame, because Frank's going hunting, and, you know, He's not going to be here next Tuesday, and it's a shame you're not coming back, you know, because I'm going to be all alone. <laughs> and, of course, you know, we go check into a hotel till Tuesday. <laughs> um, and this time, she's a lot more forthcoming. And we still haven't told her uh, who Edgar Casey is. Uh, you know, but we've let on that, you know, Casey really thought you were really special, and, and we were sort of feeling her out about her childhood, and she really had no memory before she was seven years old. I mean, it was like blank. It was like a blank slate. And um, though she did keep going on about her father, about how wonderful her dad was, and she, and she said, and I'd wake up at night and I'd have these dreams. 
I'd have these nightmares. And Dad loved me so much, he'd come upstairs, and he'd grab, you know, take me by the shoulders, and he'd shake me till the nightmares stopped. You know, it wasn't like, I'm going to wrap my arms around you. It's not going to... It wasn't like that. It was like, I'm going to shake you until the nightmare stopped. And, and then he loved me so much that, you know, when the dreams kept coming, he'd take me down to the hospital, you know, and then there'd be the electroshock therapy. And, you know, a story, you know, started getting even uglier than I thought it could have been. And um, uh, when she hit puberty, it was like, all of a sudden, everything started coming up in, in, in a real serious way. And e even to this day, I don't know the extent to which she was hospitalized when she had puberty, but it was like lithium, it's like the whole works. I, you know, um, I don't go into it with her, you know, to, 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 to that degree, but it was a real, you know, it was a real horror story. Um, uh, little things started popping up, she said, you know, and my hands would get hot, my hands would get hot, and then we'd, you know, run them under the cold water until they cooled off. I don't know, you know, there's a lot of talk about, you know, magnetic energy in hands like that, and, you know, you, you start thinking, well, maybe it will. And, of course, you know, we go check into a hotel till Tuesday. <laughs> um, and this time, she's a lot more forthcoming. And we still haven't told her uh, who Edgar Casey is. Uh, you know, but we've let on that, you know, Casey really thought you were really special. And, and we were sort of feeling her out about her childhood. And she really had no memory before she was seven years old. I mean, it was like blank. It was like a blank slate. And um, though she did keep going on about her father about how wonderful her dad was. And she, and she said, and I'd wake up at night and I'd have these dreams. I'd have these nightmares. And dad loved me so much, he'd come upstairs and he'd grab, you know, take me by the shoulders and he'd shake me till the nightmares stopped. You know, it wasn't like I'm going to wrap my arms around you. It's not going to, it wasn't like that. It was like I'm going to shake you until the nightmare stopped. And, and then he loved me so much that, you know, when the dreams kept coming, He'd take me down to the hospital, you know, and then there'd be the electroshock therapy. And, you know, a story, you know, started getting even uglier than I thought it could have been. And um, uh, when she hit puberty, it was like, all of a sudden, everything started coming up in, in, in a real serious way. And e even to this day, I don't know the extent to which she was hospitalized when she had puberty, but it was like lithium, it's like the whole works. I, you know, um, I don't go into it with her, you know, to, 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 to that degree, but it was a real, you know, it was a real horror story. Um, uh, little things started popping up, she said, you know, and my hands would get hot, my hands would get hot, and then we'd, you know, run them under the cold water until they cooled off. I don't know, you know, there's a lot of talk about, you know, magnetic energy in hands like that, and, you know, you, you start thinking, well, maybe it was true, maybe she did touch this kid with polio. Um, and I don't know if anything's there. You know, we, we eventually gave her there as a river, and um, she dropped Frank. <laughs> um... You know, and, and uh, you know, what we haven't said that much about her in, in the book, just because we don't want a whole lot of people, you know, descending upon her when she's really not ready. Um, but it's a very special, you know, special person, and, and it, it really made me stop. And, and why that reading was ultimately so powerful for me wasn't because there was proof of some kind that Casey had been right, but rather you could start viewing the lives, the childhoods especially of, of Edgar Casey and Eileen Garrett in a little different way than I was before. With Edgar Casey, uh, an entire play was written called The Freak, 
the freak, the freak, the freak. And you get a sense uh, with Casey's childhood that he was picked on and that it was just a horrible experience. And even uh, in Eileen's work, you get a sense of um, that she was just considered this strange and lonely uh, child. You know, however, both for Edgar Casey and Eileen Garrett, there was love there. There, there, there was a, a bed to sleep in, and, and there was almost like a, a nurturing environment. And you start looking at the case of a Faith Harding, who was stepped on perhaps as much as you can step on anybody, and you start wondering, well, how many other kids maybe are born with these special gifts? Uh, but it really started me thinking of childhood, and, uh, you know, whenever I, I, I sort of look at psychic phenomena, and I start looking at psychics, and I certainly look at Eileen Garrett, and I look at the similarities between Casey and Garrett, so much was developed and really started, you know, boiling, started simmering there in their early childhood. Um, for Edgar Casey, of course, uh, like Garrett, he had these imaginary playmates. You know, only... I think Edgar's playmates, he had three boys and a girl, and I think uh, Eileen had uh, two girls and a boy. Um, they had first and last names. Uh, I don't know if my imaginary playmates had first and last names, but even the earliest stories told about Casey, uh, you know, was playing with these imaginary playmates. And, you know, they not only had first and last names, but they came from exotic locales. I mean, you know, Alexandria, uh, Persia, you know, and what's a six-year-old child doing, you know, knowing these things? And, and, and of course, he was, you know, considered strange. Um, actually, these imaginary playmates are, are real interesting, and uh, I sort of extrapolate all kinds of theories uh, about them. Because, like so many people in the Casey readings, when you can put, lay the readings out and, you know, you can line them up, now that they're on a CD-ROM, you can put them chronologically, you can do them thematically, you can do them by people. You can, you know, when, when you start laying things out like that, you can see... Um, you can see patterns, you know, you didn't see before. And with these imaginary playmates, you get a sense um, that these are really spirits. Uh, you know, one of the... Um, well, one of the typical skeptic remarks, and this is certainly one I, I lodged at, at Edgar Casey too, was, okay, Edgar Casey has a vision of an angel. You can go into the museum in Hopkinsville, Kentucky, and there's a picture of his Aunt Lulu's Bible. And guess what? The angel that's in that Bible is an actual page, you know, uh, Gabriel. That angel is identical to the angel in Edgar Casey's description. So a skeptic says, oh, well, clearly he saw this angel in this picture, and that's what he interpolated or something. Uh, you know, but you start looking at these imaginary playmates, and I, I really don't think it works like that. I think the angel appeared to him as it did in Aunt Lulu's Bible, um, for the same reason that spirits appeared to him as little children, it was something that a five, six-year-old imagination could understand. These are symbols, just like dream symbols. And uh, the spirit that was that angel appeared in his imagination as the angel in Aunt Lulu's Bible, because that was something he could understand, that was something... Uh, he could live with, and I, and I think I wouldn't be surprised if the exact same thing was true with Eileen Garrett. And you look at the greater role that these little spirits play in Casey's life, and you realize what they're doing is they're keeping this little kid's feet on the ground. It's a grounding force. You know, they're, they're not only company, they're teaching him, they're giving him that love, that nurturing, that Archangel Michael's telling them to, you know telling you that Faith Harding should have. Um, 
Also, you know, interesting little parallel with, with Garrett and Casey in, in those childhood years is that death really did hold a different meaning, even back then. Um, in Eileen Garrett's case, uh, you know, it was the death of her aunt. Her aunt and a child appeared to her, you know, on the doorstep. Uh, for Edgar Casey, um, it was the death of his grandfather. And, and this story is, is, is uh, actually quite telling. Um, his grandfather was a tobacco farmer. Uh, he and Edgar, you know, were really like this. They were just, you know, everyone said they were cut from the same tree, cut from the same branch. And, um, oh, cute story. There, there was just always told that uh, Edgar went to live with his grandparents for a while, and he refused to sleep on the foot of the bed, and every time uh, he thought his grandparents were asleep, he'd crawl up in between them, and he'd grab hold of his grandfather's beard, and then his grandf grandmother would wake up, and she'd peel, uh, you know, Edgar's fingers off the beard and put him back down in the bottom of the bed, and then he'd wake up in the morning and be back up there grabbing onto the beard. I mean, it was just really tight. Uh, they were coming back from the tobacco field one morning. Uh, Edgar was sitting on the back of the horse. Grandfather, you know, let him down uh, by this pond to water the horse. A snake or something, you know, was in the muck, came up, frightened the horse. Horse bucked, kicked grandfather off, and the hooves came back down and crushed grandfather's chest. And this was five, six feet away from Edgar Casey, you know, as a child. And you'd think something, you know, like that would be a trauma. I mean, it should be in a trauma. You know, but even then, sort of like uh, Arlene Garrett's aunt, death held a sort of different meaning. And grandfather appeared in the tobacco barn, uh, still talking to him, you know, long after, you know, grandfather was in the ground, or should have been in the ground. Uh, there's so many of these wonderful parallels, mostly in their childhood, of course, because um, as they developed, you know, developed as quite, you know, remarkably different psychics. Similar, in some respects, similar in their specificity, similar in their sensitivities, um, but, you know, as individuals, very different. I mean, Edgar Casey is clearly homespun. He's clearly uh, much more comfortable uh, with children, much more comfortable with, uh, with other farmers. I mean, you know, Casey didn't go beyond an eighth grade education. Um, you know, Eileen Garrett is, is, is really the almost the opposite extreme. You, you, you have someone who uh, is very sophisticated, very intellectual, very gracious. Um, and yet, uh, you know, the readings themselves have, have so many interesting similarities. I mean, well, one, one thing they both, you know, both comes through with, with both their readings is that anyone can do and they keep saying, you know, anyone can do what I do. And that certainly comes through Garrett, certainly comes through Casey's. Um, you know, the truth is the truth. And it just, you know, comes out in, in different ways. Um, gosh, we should get to the readings they give on each other. <laughs> so I'll, I'll just pull those out. Uh, I was hoping, you know, for some fireworks in these readings, but, you know, there really isn't a whole lot of fireworks, and, I, and I'm almost disappointed. Uh, you know, we called this talk uh, du dueling psychics, and there is some, you know, dueling going on, um, and unfortunately, Casey gets skewered pretty fast in here. Um, and, uh, you know, I don't blame it all on Edgar Casey. I, I sort of blame it on Hugh Lynn Casey. That says Edgar Casey's son, because uh, it wasn't Hugh Lynn's idea to get Eileen Garrett and Casey together in the same house, but Hugh Lynn Casey ran both trance sessions. He was putting the questions, and, and it's so clear that all he is really interested in uh, is Edgar Casey, and it's such a shame because you have you know, a remarkable opportunity for two people who hands down have great talent in this regard. It's a great opportunity to, you know, see them through each other's 
uh, you know, psychic insights. And, and you know, so I want to, uh, I feel like I want to kick Hugh Lin across the floor. Pardon, Hugh Lin, if you're around here to hear this. <laughs> um, uh, Edgar Casey went first. And uh, this was a house in Staten Island. Um, and it's interesting because the three people that were there, uh, it's the Zentgraf family. And the Zentgraf family, about uh, three years after this, these readings take place, uh, they're German, they go back to Germany because uh, they're concerned about Hitler and they want to set things right. And they don't, you know, they don't come back. Uh, children come back. Uh, the other person who's witnessing the readings is, is an, becomes uh, an IBM engineer. His name is Mitchell Hastings, and he's a really interesting character. Casey gave a, a life reading on Mitchell Hastings, saying that uh, he had great engineering skills. He was only 16 at that point. He went on to Harvard, uh, then took a job with David Sarnoff at NBC, and some people believe he was responsible for FM radio, uh, and he eventually went off to IBM. Um, uh, Casey and Garrett are very different in, you know, the way they go into trance. With Edgar Casey, um, uh, he always needed someone, well, he did, he needed someone to plant a suggestion. He was very passive in that, in that regard, and had been since he was a child. For Casey, uh, really the first readings began when he was hypnotized. It was not an active thing that he learned to do. It was merely he laid back and concentrated and right before the moment he would go to sleep, if you put a suggestion to him, he would answer the questions. He would do, uh, do your bidding. It's a sort of running joke in our household about uh, Gertrude Casey, because Gertrude Casey often ran uh, you know, put the suggestions to Edgar is why she didn't, you know, say, okay, well, uh, this is actually something Eileen Garrett would have said, is, you know, there's laundry to be done, and there's uh, dishes in the dishwasher, and, uh, you know, you got to muck out the barns, and you're not going to remember anything I say, have said when, when you wake up. <laughs> but it's a shame they didn't do that. Um, well, anyway, so it's Hugh Lynn run, running, running this trans session. Um, and... Uh, uh, he, he's putting his father down. Now you will have before you the sole entity now known as Eileen Garrett, present in this room. You will give at this time such information regarding her work, which will be interesting and helpful in relation to our experiments today. You will answer the questions which I ask. Casey is not known for being very straightforward. In the medical readings, you know, you get names, dates, locations, and in, in the past life readings, you get actual, you know, some good stuff, direct stuff. It's all very convoluted, and the response to this is like the epitome of convolution here. That which may be given through this entity is that which is received through the varied channels that present themselves in that atmosphere or that environment that seeks for an understanding in those fields of activities that may bring to the manifested actions of individuals those influences that may bear upon the lives and souls of individuals. Wow. You could probably translate that you know, very, very simply, as I'll tell you uh, what, it, what you need to know, but I may have to go to different sources to get it. Um, he goes, he continues on, as to how, to whom, or from what sources these emanations or activities may take their action, depends upon first the sincerity of purpose as to whether it is to be constructive in the experience of such seekers, or whether through self there is to be the aggrandizement of power, influence, or force. For as ye sow, so shall ye reap. That's, it's very standard, Edgar Casey. It could, could be given for uh, virtually any of the, you know, 1,000 or 1,400 people he gives uh, trance readings for. First question. Explain how this information is now being given for Miss Garrett, the source of this information. A portion is from the soul development of the entity that has been made and does make for a channel through which 
spiritual or psychic forces may manifest in a material world. Also, from those influences from without that are, are, that are either in those attitudes of being teachers, instructors, directors, or those that would give to those in the material plane the better comprehension. Uh, you know, it's convoluted, but essentially it's saying, you know, uh, Eileen Garrett in previous incarnations, uh, previous experiences on Earth, has struggled and wrestled and developed this ability. Um, and that in one of those incarnations, or maybe multiple, um, uh, you know, she was a teacher, an instructor, a director, um, as she is now, in many respects. Um, for what purpose was this power given to her? That there might be given, as it were, the opportunity for the soul to use that it has built itself to make for a manifestation in a material world of those influences that are without and within. Again, you know, I apologize, I apologize for Edgar Casey, but you have to read a whole lot of Edgar Casey. You have to take, remove a lot of words before you can easily, you know, digest what he's saying. And, and I think in this case, he's essentially saying that um, Eileen Garrett is doing this to make the unseen world seen. And that the more she does this, the greater her impact, uh, the greater good she is doing. How can Mrs. Garrett develop her ability to the highest degree? By keeping self in accord in the inner self with that which is the highest that may manifest itself through the abilities and faculties of the soul body. Um, I'm not exactly sure what that means. Maybe uh, essentially it says, you know, seek for your highest self and the highest information will come through. Um, do Mrs. Garrett's psychic powers depend upon previous development? It's sort of been answered earlier, uh, but uh, Hewlin is asking that again. Yes. During those days and periods when those activities known as the Zoroastrian were active in the peoples of the land, the entity then was not only an instructor, a teacher, one that gave much more to aid people at that period when the fires of life had burned low, but the entity made for the awakening within the hearts and minds of many whose relationships uh, uh, between the creative influence in the spiritual realm with the activities among men. Hence, a guide, a teacher, that aided much in those experience, experiences, aids in manifesting to those that seek to seek materializations of those forces. Boy, you know, tough stuff to get through. Uh, um, and, and I don't think he's really saying all that much new uh, you know, that hasn't been said many times about Eileen Garrett. Um, uh, you know, that she's bringing this up from her heart and soul and from many previous, ins previous incarnations. Who are Mrs. Miss Garrett's spiritual guides? And tell us something about them. Let them rather speak for themselves. I like that, it's such a nice twist. Let them rather speak for themselves. Their names are rather in her experience, in her seeking, than to find through other channels, even though they may be coming from the records that are made by each in their activity. Speak for thyself. In, in some respects, that's a ducking. Uh, of, I mean, it's not really answering the question. It's just essentially saying, I can't tell you. Eileen Garrett will have to tell you, I think. Uh, is Mrs. Garrett contacting the highest possible sources for information in accordance with her development? Uh, she is seeking for the self, for the soul's protection, for the abilities it seeks. It contacts that which is sufficient unto the needs of the soul in its development. Oh, I wish I could help you with this. I can't help myself. It, it's... Uh, um, is not being very direct. Is there any way in which Mrs. Garrett may be of special service to the work of Edgar Cayce? That, you know, that's a good question. As their channels acti of activity cross or run one into another, 
in the various phases of experience, there may be those aids that will be for the common good of all. Those who give themselves, as both may be found doing, that's both Casey and Garrett, for the common good of mankind, as they merge in their efforts in these directions, may there be the aids rather one for the other. For, as has been given, in the union there is strength, whether this be applied in those things pertaining to the least in the earth or the greater in the realm of the spiritual activity. Hence, each in clear purpose of desire to be of aid to their fellow man, not for self, but for the glory of God. I don't know. It's not very direct as far as I'm concerned. Um, and unfortunately, the rest of this reading, Hugh Lynn Casey uh, sort of shows exactly what, um, really what's on his mind, because the, the entire rest of the reading are questions about Casey. Would you explain why Edgar Casey uses the method of, of hypnosis to go into trance? If Edgar Casey has ever had controls, does he know who they are? Is Edgar Casey clairvoyant in the hypnotic state? Yeah, this is a great opportunity for really going in with Eileen Garrett while you have her here, but he doesn't. Do you suggest that trance is a, a useful method for help? How did it arise? Was it, an ac was it an accident? Or did some entity suggest this plan? If Edgar Casey goes into trance without control, could he not do so in a waking state? You know, makes me really want to kick Hewlin because it really is a wonderful opportunity but we do, however, have Eileen Garrett's readings on Edgar Cayce. And, and I think these, you know, we're, we get something, and they're a lot easier to understand. Essentially, Edgar Cayce gave his reading at 11.50. They sat down and had lunch, and Eileen Garrett, you know, gave hers uh, at 3.15. And Eileen Garrett, you didn't have to put the suggestion to her. Um, she put herself into trance. Um, right out of the chute. It is I, Yuvani. Am I pronouncing, is it Yuvani? Right. It is I, Yuvani. I give you greeting, friends. Peace be with you and in your life and in your work and in your household. I give you greeting, my friends. What is it you would have of me, please? Very, very respectful spirit coming through here. Um, what, you, what can you tell us regarding Mr. Casey's, Edgar Casey's psychic work? I find him as I come in contact with the emanations that come from him into this room, peculiarly intuitive, super sensitive, and yet, yet not using all the power that is within him. I find that there is great passivity of consciousness which permits him the amazing reflective value which I am sure he is capable of using. I am seeing that the vibrations give to him much in the method of chemical formation, and I do not know at all if he has ever laid on hands on the sick, but I am sure that he possesses a great deal of magnetic force within his hands, and I do feel that sometime it would relieve him to use it. If he does not do this, it is probably because his own subconscious mind has said to him that he is a passive personality who will easily accept things. I am certain I also feel that it would be helpful for him to stimulate his clairvoyant vision so that he might become aware of the strength of the people who do work with him. I am certain that whatever his own reflective qualities are, there are still centers within him within him that can be used to greater clarification. It doesn't even need explanation. It's very straightforward, and I think she really hits uh, an Edgar Casey, one of, you know, a serious Edgar Casey problem on the head. It's also, you know, I may more, it may be easier for me to be reading things into Garrett's reading, because I know so much more about Casey than I knew Garrett. But it is interesting about Ed Edgar Casey's hands, because he refused. A, a number of people asked him, you know, to lay his hands on people, and he just absolutely refused. And there are two occasions um, with the woman who married Edgar Casey's son, who actually had warts, had a bunch of warts on her hands, and, uh, you know, Edgar Casey clapped, uh, held her hands while he was talking to her one day, 
And uh, when he let go, they, the warts just dropped off. I don't know. I don't know. But he, it is an interesting point. Um, question. What do you find is the source of his information when he goes into trance? He passes into the etheric state. He, therefore, as it were, is outside his body. In this state, he is aware of the bodily contacts that can come to him, and also is his vision exhilarated by all that may be happening in your area. But he can do more than this. He can see within the reflection of his own life that that is fundamental, not only to himself, but also to the people he may work with, if he is in strong sympathy with them. Um, that really is excellent. One, one of the great leaps forward that Edgar Cayce made in, in his own uh, trance work was realizing that if the person coming to him had a genuine, desperate need, he really, his heart went out to them, he sympathized, and when he was in trance, greater, easier material just flowed through him. And also, if you could get more than one person together in a room asking the question, you know, it, it was much stronger. Uh, however, it makes a great drain that he does, that he does not help, admit help in this. Did he admit of help at all as someone who would interpret for him, it would give him so much more ability to accomplish more. By that I mean he would not himself feel the inner exhaustion. Not only is he coming out of the body, drawing away from it as he is using his full etheric leverage, and is also drawing upon his own spiritual light for your assistance. While it may be said, therefore, that he did, uh, that ever did he use this without help, he is giving you something of his own life. You see, it is a terrific strain upon him, and if he will permit help, there will be less effort in getting away. I, this becomes clear later. It's a theme that really runs through this reading, which is essentially, right now, Edgar Cayce is doing what he does virtually entirely on his own, and Eileen Garrett in trance is suggesting that he, uh, if, if he asks for some help, there's a lot of help waiting. Uh, and one of the ways that help can come is in translating what's coming through him uh, into more accessible prose. <laughs> uh, maybe I just read into that. Um, does his psychic tap power depend upon previous incarnations? In his case, very definitely so, yes. Unless he, unless he had indeed understood in the past the laws of passivity, the laws of withdrawal, and the inner law of knowing, he would not be able to get this reflection through himself. Um, I am not sure, but passivity seems to be very much uh, Edgar Cayce. Very passive when he's in trance. People, you know, have to come to him he doesn't really actually put himself directly into trance. Uh, can you describe any of his previous de development? Can you describe any of this previous development of his for us? I have a very, very strong feeling about his previous development. I am not going into it at any great length with you, but there is no doubt at all that he has had a very, very strong tie-up with northern India as also he has two instances with Egypt. It is his northern Indian experience that he is in conflict with at this moment. It is that, in a sense, that obscures his vision. Um, what Garrett's talking about, and, and I think is is important uh, when you get to know Casey, Garrett couldn't possibly have known at this point she's giving this reading, Edgar Casey's own previous life readings. Th these were really kept private. And in the Casey readings, much information has been given Edgar Casey about his own, you know, previous incarnations. The one incarnation which is blank, which, which we know existed because it's suggested in any number of readings, is an incarnation in India. Something happened in India. The source doesn't want to talk about it. 
Edgar Casey doesn't want to know about it. Eileen Garrett is essentially saying, do something about it. Deal with it. It'll increase your vision. You'll improve. Um, can you tell us, do you find that you have any contact with this entity in the past? No, but there are those around me who often speak, who knew him well. I am an Arab. Uh, remember the experimenting this morning in which Mr. Casey, my father, gave a psychic reading for Miss Garrett, through whom you speak. What can you tell us regarding that entity? Answer. I was not present, my friend, at this experience. Also, I have not your father's permission to speak of this. Edgar Casey says, go ahead, you may speak about it. And I, and I think this is really the heart and soul. I mean, if anything you can walk away with in these readings about each other, it's really this passage that is good. Essentially, it addresses this previous Indian incarnation. You are connected with the worship of the child god or the elephant. These two are in very close contact at all times with your beloved parent. He's talking to Hugh Lin. So he's talking about Edgar. But I am very certain that he must have suffered great torture and great sacrifice during this understanding, with the results that a contact with him is almost, as it were, blocked out. And that is a pity, because I think they come back to make something very right for him that has been wrong. And I believe that he can use this to his own greater work. But the one that I have the most impression of, please, and one I can see as being valuable to you, is a man of strong and ardent physique. You will find that he has much of the look of an Arab, of a Hebrew. I do not think he is of Hebrew understanding, perhaps Greek. But he must have come into the Hebrew contact to understand it and to stimulate and to revive it in his own understanding. In such a one, greater humanity bespeaks than you will find with the Hebrew understanding. What he's talking about is, is a specific aspect of Edgar Cayce. Um, he does at all times come in contact with your beloved parent and would help him at all times. He, know that he knows, therefore, much of the uh, Mosaic law. He knows of the law of Chaldea and the law of Egyptian understanding of energy and light. So it would seem to me that he has stood in very, very close contact to you at all times and has on more than one occasion revealed himself to you. Believe me, my friend, I thank you that you permit me to speak with you like this. But if you knew the infinite power for good that you have behind you, you would not be discouraged at this moment. You would really permit this little experiment of opening up the help of one that may stand between you and the invasions that hinder your work when you are doing this almost un unaided. If you open your arms to the loving help that this one would give to you, it would renew a, a virility and ease and immediately give you greater peace of mind. Um, just one, just two other questions. Uh, what would you re recommend or suggest? He should stand up. He should permit help. This is Edgar Casey, the sleeping prophet. He's being told to stand up. It really might have changed a lot of things. I mean, I'm not suggesting Edgar Casey didn't go do great things, uh, but it was always in a very passive environment. So he's telling the sleeping prophet to stand up. He should stand up and permit help. I mean that because I do feel that he is not himself entirely strong enough to carry the load of these responsibilities any further. Because he is using his own light, he is dimming his own light. Let him get help to himself. I am sure you understand how very tired, how sometimes hopeless it all must seem, how his own clarifications is often bewildered by the ill judgments of people not capable of judging. You do know that. You live with him. So you know a little of the complete misunderstandings of most who come into daily contact with him. They come into his life and proceed to take him to pieces. Is it not so that he has suffered? Not if he permits somebody like myself to come in, who will help him clarify that he sees, and when he is not able to clarify for himself, 
it will give him greater light, for I and others like me hold but a light upon the road for the weary. I love that. I and others like me hold but a light upon the road for the weary, so that they will not make the same mistakes from the self-same experience that we have encountered. I'm going to skip this, because I think, yeah. Is there any advice or guidance for those who are to assist and direct and help to expand my father's psychic work? I wish they had asked that exact same question, you know, to Eileen Garrett. I mean, it's, it's, it's embarrassing. Um, do what you can to be that instrument through which his strength may be directed. I would say very def definitively, if you want to help him, make it possible for him to have peace of mind during this new change that comes upon him. Let him, for mercy's sake, live without the feeling that he owes to you all anything in this way or that. If you are interested in his sincerity, and your own sin sincerity is good and sufficiently right for him, then you will infuse the spirit of understanding to those whom he has been helpful to. Help him to gain strength. He needs a bodily strength. He needs a physical strength. He needs a little peace of mind that he may go out and come back and better possess himself. And give him your trust. And if some new life come in, do not run away from the old understanding that has helped you, but on to the new light. And let it make the knowledge more valuable to you. Show your appre appreciation. Unfortunately, Casey really didn't take the advice. You know, I, I qualify that, unfortunately, but um, uh, he didn't. And, uh, you know, one of the things that consistently was running through this reading, I didn't read you the entire passage, but it, it's essentially that um, every time Casey goes into trance, um, you know, there's not an Yuvani standing next to him, is essentially doing all the heavy lifting. And this is literally a drain. And uh, uh, Garrett certainly picked up on this because, you know, four years later, he would be dead. And um, uh, at that point, you know, they, they said that he should be giving three readings a day. He was giving nine and twelve. Um, his secretary called this a, a drain machine, doing the readings. It was a, a drain machine for Edgar Casey, Hour by hour, day by day, I could see some vital life sustenance ebbing from the body of the man whom I had come to admire and love in some special personal way. It was, you know, uh, it's interesting how things could have changed. And uh, uh, certainly Eileen Garrett held that out. And, uh, you know, so in that way, you know, certainly psychic dueling, uh, she hit it on the money. I don't know how she would have done on medical diagnoses. Uh, but she was very convincing to me in this. Any questions? Um, when she was talking about help, did she seem to be meaning like, uh, like a from spiritual help, or was it like better secretaries? <laughs> she really wasn't getting yeah. It. Um, yeah, I, I think you weren't getting it because I, I, I wasn't reading, you know, I, I was jumping through some of the questions. Essentially, it's help on the other side. Help that, uh, well, she's suggesting two things. She's suggesting first that he stand up and not lay down, that he take a more active participation. You know, when, when Garrett could go, Garrett could literally put herself into trance and sort of welcome Ivani in and... Um, didn't appear to be as exhausted as Edgar Casey was. I don't know when, when I, Garrett came out of readings. Um, I think Garrett is suggesting that um, he have an interpreter and a helpmate with him. And you also, you, you get a sense that, um, well, one, you get a sense that you're very rarely alone. You know, that spirits are, are literally all over the place all the time. And you get a sense that um, uh, there are a lot of spirits who want to help, who want to help anyone. And you, it's just a question of inviting them in. Um, 
I think Casey himself was certainly reluctant to do that because he believed his gift was a gift directly from God and um, to welcome a spirit in would be uh, would go against you know being a, it being a gift from God or at least in his own mind I think that he 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 viewed it as summoning a spirit he viewed what he was doing as not I mean if you asked him what he was doing um, he was merely channeling a, a divine source he wouldn't have even said channeling that he would say a divine source was speaking through him. They're great ghost stories, though, with, with Casey. Uh, I, I love the ghost stories. That was one of the things that really kept, uh, kept me interested in, in his story, because a real effort was made uh, after Casey died and right up you know, through the 1970s uh, to squash any uh, stories of sort of conscious clairvoyance that Casey would sometimes have. Um, but the ghost stories are, are very telling and, and very interesting. Um, my favorite is this story about Bunchy. Bunchy, it's sort of, Bunchy was a um, sort of light-headed phot photographic assistant in Selma, Alabama. And she really didn't have a whole lot. Sort of not the sharpest crayon in the pack. Um, I mean, the little story that's told about her is that when, you know, the fires, surrounded Casey all the time. So literally, Casey couldn't go more than three or four years before either a photo studio burning up or part of his house or his grandmother's house. There was fires just all over the place with him. But um, it was a fire in the photo studio in Selma and Bunchy was sent into the pantry to get the um, uh, china, to save Gertrude's china. And she went into it, rushing in there and taking this, carefully taking the china off the shelf, bringing it to the window and dropping it, you know, <laughs> down two, two flights down. She's all, all flustered. Um, uh, but there's a, a cute story that, that's told by Gertrude about um, uh, when Bunchy came back. A couple years later, they're not in Selma, they're in Virginia Beach, and there's literally a rapping at the window. And, um, you know, I suppose, I mean, you have to ask yourself sort of what it would be like to be married to somebody like Eileen Garrett, or to have a husband like Edgar Casey, or even have a kid like Edgar Casey. I mean, you really, um, uh, it's a good question to ask, but, y you know, when you live with somebody for th that amount of years, you know, where you sort of get used to their foibles, and you, 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 you know, sort of start taking things for, for granted, very real things. And, and I'm sure when Bunchy starts rapping at the upstairs window, Gertrude sort of just sort of gives... El, you know, a little elbow, because Gertrude was a very light sleeper, give Edgar a little elbow and says, you know, go see who it is. And um, apparently Edgar went over and opened the window, and there was Bunchy, and he started a conversation with Bunchy, and um, Gertrude, who was trying to sleep, said, you know, take it downstairs. <laughs> you, you, you get a sense, you know, a, a, when you live with somebody like this for a while, you do things sort of, you know... Um, Anyway, so the next morning, Gertrude wanted to know what Bunchy wanted, and uh, apparently Bunchy uh, remembered that Edgar Casey gave these medical readings, and she believed she was dying, and that she needed real medical help, and so she went looking for Edgar Casey to get a reading, and Edgar Casey sort of had to tell her it was too late. She's already dead. <laughs> You're already dead. <laughs> and to sort of steer her off into a, a, a good direction. Um, Anyway, there's a, a, a lot of cute ghost stories. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you so much. This was wonderful. I'm glad you enjoyed it.